funded by the county. Is yep. that right? Well, I haven't got the bill yet, but <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> but when, uh, when Abe gets up to give his portion of it and talk about uh, information that's needed so that uh, the aquifers can be better managed and controlled out there for quantity and quality, I just want you to know that this is one of the things that we're talking about. Okay, with that, uh, I'm going to introduce Don Bills from the USGS, and he's going to talk about perched aquifers. So, actually, in this segment, uh, you're going to hear from both uh, uh, Dr. Springer and I. Um, I'm going to start out talking very generally about perched water bearing systems, perched aquifers, uh, what they are, and then Abe is going to provide uh, some additional information about the uh, study Ron, uh, Ron just mentioned, and uh, hopefully some of the past work the university has done with uh, uh, by using uh, students, the student pieces, uh, looking for their value in the past. So why Oh, how did you make you work for the water bearing zones. What we in the US Geological Survey referred to as perched water bearing zones. Other people call them perched aquifer. Perched aquifers, same thing. Uh, uh, and uh, I just want to back up a little bit. You've been hearing from uh, state uh, regulatory agencies and Coconino County. So far, the USGS is a federal science agency. We have no regulatory authority or control. We're all about the science. And we work with local, state, and federal agencies uh, to develop uh, good science-based information, uh, particularly related uh, to water resources. So, first water bearing zones, uh, what are they? Uh, I'm going to be using uh, Fort Valley as, a, uh, as an example throughout these few slides. But I want to point out that this, these, uh, even though I'm talking about Fort Valley, these characteristics about first water bearing zones apply to any first water bearing zones in northern Arizona. So this is the Fort Valley area, a uh, Google Earth image on the left, and a surface geology map on the right, uh, just to get you a little bit oriented. Uh, so I want to point out one thing on this image, and that's this uh, uh, line that you see right here. It's uh, what we call a cross section. And I'm going to be referring to this in one of my later uh, slides. Uh, it runs approximately uh, from the uh, north end of Fort Valley uh, down to just a little bit south of uh, 180. It's only uh, it's only one third of a mile long, so it's not a very long cross section. So, first water bearing zones. Um, at least in the immediate Flagstaff area, they occur northwest and south of Flagstaff. We typically don't see them on the east side of the Flags uh, east side of Flagstaff, and that's because the geology out there just does not support or hold water close enough to ground. Uh, for it to represent a productive water bearing zone. First water bearing zones are typically small. They're discontinuous, and what I mean by that is they're not interconnected. So that if there is a first water bearing zone in the Fort Valley area, it bears no relationship whatsoever to the first water bearing zones that occur out in parks. Those are totally different uh, uh, groundwater flow systems. There's uh, the geology uh, that contain, or the rocks that contain these first water bearing zones uh, can change pretty dramatically depending on where you are. But throughout the Flagstaff area, these first water bearing zones are found in channel alluvium, volcanic rock, either uh, fracture basalts or cinders, 
um, sandy siltstone and sandy limestone units between uh, below the volcanic rocks. And for scale, for a little bit of scale here, uh, I'm, I'm showing uh, this little upper uh, layer of consolidated rock in this whole sequence of sedimentary rocks underlying the Flagstaff area as just that little bit of uh, volcanic material and alluvial material in the Fort Valley area. You can see how small that is in the context of the surrounding volcanic rocks and the underlying uh, much more extensive regionally uh, uh, um, sandstone and uh, limestones and siltstones that make up the regional flow systems that in this part of the state are typically at great depth below land surface. Mm -hmm. Another thing I want to point out about first water bearing zones is that they're very sensitive to seasonal and annual precipitation. Uh, what I mean by that is just what uh, I've been hearing from you as you're asking questions and getting responses uh, from other people on the panel so far. The fact that in some years the water table is very high, in other years the water table is very low. In some, and sometimes uh, it goes extended periods uh, where the water table is very low, and in some cases you, some of you may experience your wells drying up. And that's just a uh, comment on the size of these, or that's a that's property of these perch water bearing zones related to the fact that they're very small aerially, and they don't uh, they don't uh, get a whole lot of recharge coming into them to replenish them on a on a seasonal or an annual basis. So when you're in a dry cycle or dry conditions. Those first water bearing zones, the water tables are going to be low, and as you continue to develop them over time to support your normal domestic needs, that will draw the water table down even lower until you get into a wet season, uh, the winter months, where you have some recharge uh, flowing back into the system or a series of wet years where you actually fill those first water bearing zones up entirely. So I pulled this graphic out of the report that Sybil mentioned uh, during her talk. And this is a uh, cross-section that ADEQ uh, developed to represent, in a very general sense, uh, the subsurface sub conditions in the Fort Valley area as it relates to uh, where you might expect to find water. And you'll notice that these low water bearing zones occur here, there, and everywhere at all different depths throughout the Fort Valley area. And they're not necessarily inter interconnected. You have fairly dense lava flows uh, that may actually uh, represent barriers uh, to water from moving from, say, this water bearing zone here to this water bearing zone here. However, if the conditions are right, you may have water uh, in uh, this unconsolidated material, the cinders, uh, the silts, and the gravels uh, interbedded with the uh, basalts may actually flow, whoops, may actually flow off the uh, end of this uh, basalt layer and trickle down to this next one below it. So, you know, where you have a well developed uh, has a lot to do with uh, what the depth of water is going to be in that well. And just because your neighbor, uh, you know, 100 feet away may have a productive well at very close to land surface doesn't mean that you will have a productive well very close to land surface on your property. So what I did uh, is I took some information out of the AD, ADWR database. Uh, these are well records from wells out there in the Fort Valley area. What I did was I constructed a little bit more detailed cross-section of the uh, subsurface geology from the, for about a third of a mile from the north end of Fort Valley uh, to just cross 180. And uh, this is a very generalized cross-section, generally north to south. And up at the north end, 
um, I used uh, this one deep well up there that goes all the way down uh, to the uh, sandstone units in the uh, Supai Formation. And they're actually developing water uh, out of what we call the sea aquifer, the Coconino Sandstone Aquifer. Up here in the upper part of this well, where there's alluvial fill that's part of that uh, uh, Rio de Flag system, and underneath that, the salt flows, those units are dry, essentially. They, don't, they didn't encounter any water when they drilled that deep well in those units. But as you move southward uh, across Port Valley, here's another well uh, that encountered the alluvial fill, uh, some of the basalt, some clay layers and lenses, some gravel, uh, some more basalt, some more clay, some more uh, basalt. And the water was actually found in the gravel. And in this case, the water level was 80 feet below land surface, had a yield of 108 gallons per minute. That's one of the highest yielding wells in those first water bearing zones out there in the Fort Valley area. Move a little bit further to the south, here's another well. Um, this particular well, uh, more uh, alluvial fill, uh, pretty significant layer of cinders and boulders. And it's the cinders and boulders that are water bearing. Uh, basalt underneath it is dry. This other layer of cinders in this particular well is dry also. Uh, the basalt below it is dry. And the clay below that is dry. So in this well, the static wall low is 150 feet below uh, the surface. It only yields 10 gallons of water. Uh, and then you move a little bit further south still, uh, you move off of this alluvial material onto a little bit of clay located at the surface in, at, at this left particular well site. Again, you have water bearing cinders and boulders, uh, but the salt below it is essentially dry. And in the very bottom of the well, uh, you have some sandy, uh, some sandy siltstone, uh, which is probably uh, this uh, consolidated rock unit referred to as Torwick Formation. So looking at the uh, uh, depth water range for all of wells uh, that are recorded in the ADWR da uh, database, just those wells in the first water bearing zone, uh, I came up with a range uh, for depth water from one feet below land surface to a little bit greater than 400 feet below land surface. And in terms of well yield, I saw a range uh, from two gallons a minute to that one well at 108 gallons a minute. But typically the range of most of those wells is five to 10 gallons a minute. So somebody had the question a little bit earlier about uh, the connectivity uh, between the surface water and groundwater. Uh, there was a comment made that there's no um, legal distinction uh, between surface water and groundwater in Arizona, that they're uh, that they're completely uh, separate legally. What I wanted to show here is that uh, surface water and groundwater resources are interconnected. Uh, in a, in a uh, stream like Oak Creek, the perennial flow of that stream, that is the base flow during the uh, spring and winter months, is totally supported by groundwater discharge from a regional aquifer system that's feeding into that system. You have water coming into the uh, creek, uh, and that's where the groundwater comes from. Uh, some reaches of the Little Colorado River are what we call an intermittent stream. Uh, the water table is below, or generally right at the bottom of the stream bed. So depending on seasonally how much moisture there is in the stream, you have water moving into the stream or moving back out from the stream. Uh, the Rio de Flag and a lot of the other drainages in uh, areas around Flagstaff for what we call ephemeral streams. Uh, that means that most of the time they do not flow at all. They only flow in response to runoff events, and that's because the water table is significantly below uh, the surface. So all the water during, not all the water, but a portion of the water during those runoff events is moving down uh, out of the stream and into the ground. And I'm gonna have to move through uh, these uh, last few slides rather quickly. So in a wet year, 
in that ephemeral stream. You may actually have a water table in that flow system up very close to land surface. So you're actually seeing flow in the stream a lot longer than you're normally used to seeing it. And, uh, you know, it may not dry up for a much longer period of time. Um, thinking about the impacts of well systems and how they relate to the potential for contamination uh, in these first water bearing zones. In a normal to dry year, as you're using your well, you're going to develop uh, this, what's called a corner depression that's causing water to flow uh, all directions around the well into the well. And the water table is being depressed, uh, you know, locally and uh, less so out or away from the well. You'll notice that a septic system, in this case, is typically high and dry and has good, uh, in, uh, good filtration potential to bring the leach line uh, down to the water table. So you get that extra added effect of water being cleaned a little bit more uh, than it would uh, during a wet year when the water table is much closer to land surface and as you're pumping your well you still see that corner depression but you also see that the depth of water uh, underlying or in the vicinity of the septic system is at the same level as the septic system so the potential for contamination may be much higher there. Um, this is another way of showing that uh, in planner view and it, it's kind of looking at what happens when you have a septic system on an adjacent piece of property that may not have the same setback from your well as your well has from your septic system and how that may impact uh, the uh, water chemistry <coughs> in your well. So uh, with that, I, I've got my question slide. I'm just going to leave that up there, but I want to turn it over to Abe now to uh, go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, some of the studies the university has done and what they potentially are going to be able to do to look at uh, uh, some of these issues in the future. Thank you.